This is Thursday, March 10, 2011. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged and thrilled to have with us today Colonel Carrie Otto. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you very much. May I ask when you were born? I was born in September of 1966. And where were you born? I was born in Moscow, Idaho. And your current address? I work at Natick Labs here in Natick, Massachusetts. And it's also known as the Soldier? Soldier System Center. Mm -hmm. But everybody calls it Natick Labs. Labs. The Labs. Yes. People, yes. When I talk about it downtown, they say, oh, you mean the Labs. <laughs> <laughs> Marital status? I'm married. And do you have children? I do not. But I understand you have a... I have a dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and where and when did you enter the military? I entered the military through a program called ROTC. It's the Reserve Officer Training Corps. Mm -hmm. um, and they had a program where they offer you a four-year scholarship. Um, so they pay for your education for you to get a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. um, and then in exchange for them paying for your education, you then owe them an obligation of time serving on active duty in the military. Okay. And when was this? This was way back when in 1985. And where was this? I went to school at uh, Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. And why did you join at the time? At that time, it was A, it was a good way to get an, an edu education. Mm -hmm. um, B, it was a great way to pay for college. Um, my dad was on active duty in the military and happened to be part of his job was encouraging folks in high school, folks in their early years of college to consider um, ROTC or to consider pursuing the military as a way to fund their education and as a way to um, join the military later on. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about your dad for a moment. Okay. Uh, he was in the Army? Yes, he was. And how long was he in the Army? He was in the Army for 20 years, so he was a, a careerist. Okay, was he on active duty? Did he serve any combat? He served in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, he joined the Army in 1968, and his first tour was in Vietnam. Okay, and what's your dad's name, by the way? My dad's name is Norman. And is he still, is he still he, around? He is still with us, yes, wow. I'm blessed. Mm -hmm. And let's uh, get back to you. Um, why did you choose the Army? Why did I choose the Army? Um, for a variety of reasons, but the, okay. the overriding part of the decision was um, the Army would pay for I was interested in biological sciences, mm -hmm. um, and although the Air Force had a, a great scholarship program, as did the Navy, the Army was the only service that would pay for um, me to get my education in biological sciences. Okay. And did friends or family join the service when you did? No, I was the only one at that particular time. Okay. And where were you sent for basic training? I went to, there's two parts of basic training when you go through ROTC. Mm -hmm. The first part is um, while you're still in college, they send you through six weeks of summer camp is what they call it. Um, mm -hmm. But basically it's six weeks of learning how to function in the Army, the very, very basics of firing your weapon, mm -hmm. land navigation. And I completed that at Fort Lewis, Washington. Mm -hmm. And then once I graduated from college and was commissioned, mm -hmm. I went to um, my officer basic course at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. So this would be now around 1989? It was actually 1991. 1991. Mm -hmm. And now you're at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, mm -hmm. and tell us what that was like. It was hot. <laughs> it was, I, I hit Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri in June, and mm -hmm. so it was, um, it was hot, it was humid, and it was quite the climate adjustment coming from Colorado, which mm -hmm. is at a higher elevation, a much drier climate. Um, so it was culture shock in, in many ways, moving mm -hmm. from the high desert down. Um, but basic training itself, the officer basic course itself, was it, it was fun mm -hmm. um, in, in a strange sort of way. You, you get to, um, you get, actually get to experience all of the things that they had talked about while you were in ROTC, and so mm -hmm. you get to experience it and learn it. Um, and do firsthand many of the things that you'll be doing later down, later on down the road mm -hmm. when you're actually um, a, a platoon leader or you're actually doing 
what it is the Army has said you're going to do. Um, I was an engineer, commissioned as an engineer officer, mm -hmm. um, and so my, my time at Fort Leonard Wood was spent um, learning how to build bridges, learning how to build, um, I would call them rudimentary structures, but mm -hmm. when the Army goes into a new location, they have to build base camps for the soldiers to live in, so we learned how to do that. We learned how to plan base camps. Mm -hmm. um, the, the bridging piece was fascinating because anytime mm -hmm. you can play over the water, above the water, that's, that's a great thing. Um, learning how to fire your weapon, mm -hmm. um, learning how to make calculations for, for concrete and the load and just got to use your brain a, a lot. And the best part was we got to build things and then we got to blow things up. <laughs> wow. So, um, so you went from biological sciences to building and blowing up I, bridges. I, I did. I, I did. Um, now you're talking, this is, uh, how long were you in this uh, Fort Leonard Wood? I was at Fort Leonard Wood for right at six months. It's a very mm -hmm. compressed training and, and again it's the basic course and so right. they give you the mm -hmm. basics of leadership and the basics of here's what you do as an engineer officer mm -hmm. and then you once you're assigned at your first unit you actually get to practice that and okay. put those theories into practice. Now this is around the same time of the invasion of Iraq and Kuwait. It was just after that. Just after that yes. so you had to uh, Right. I missed it by about, um, the troops were coming out of Kuwait and Iraq um, after um, Desert Storm 1, mm -hmm. and six weeks later I was starting the basic course, so okay. my timing was just a little off. So tell me what happened after Leonard Wood. You're now a second lieutenant? I'm a second lieutenant, mm -hmm. um, and I went to, I had the opportunity to go to airborne school mm -hmm. after that, which some folks make make the joke it's where you learn how to jump out of perfectly good airplanes uh -huh. um, but it's a it was a great opportunity to you get to face your fears head on um, and and so you do three weeks of jumping out of things from a height and it's they set up the training so you're there's a certain height mm -hmm. 34 feet is the magic number and at 34 feet your depth perception is such that you feel like you're much much higher mm -hmm. and that's the the height that they make you jump from again and again and again so to get it right and then your last week you actually get to jump out of the airplanes when you're jumping from 34 feet were you jumping with a chute or without without a chute but you're basically on a string line I see. and so nowadays you know as i look back at it um, the Army has paid me to do things that other people pay good money to do on their vacations. Mm -hmm. um, and so now here in this area there's lots of adventure challenge kind of stuff where mm -hmm. you go from tree to tree to tree um, on a string line. The Army gave me that opportunity before mm -hmm. it was in vogue. All right, so now from biological science to building bridges, <laughs> and now you're um, learning how to parachute. Exactly. What happens now? What <laughs> happens next? I went to, I was assigned to Fort Carson, Colorado. Um, so you're back pretty much And back I'm home. back in Colorado. I, I had asked the Army, I said, please send me any place but Colorado. Mm -hmm. I, I had asked to go overseas, mm -hmm. and they said, no, we're, we're going to send you to Fort Carson. So I was, I was hoping to see the world, but that it wasn't meant to be at that time. Uh-huh. Um, but shortly after I got to Fort Carson, they immediately deployed us to mm -hmm. um, Belize, down in Central America, where we were for three months, and we built a bridge um, mm -hmm. over a floodplain. And, and I didn't realize it at the time. I, you know, I'm very young. I'm mm -hmm. very naive. Um, but it was a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. Um, it, Belize is a very, very small country. Mm -hmm. Um, but I had the opportunity to, to interact with the ambassador of the country. And, and when you're 23, 24 years old, that's fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, how many other folks can, can say that? I had the opportunity to interface with, with the, the local populace. Mm -hmm. um, I had the opportunity to compliments of the ambassador because there were so few women in my unit, mm -hmm. um, and he was trying to promote women in the military in that country. Mm -hmm. Um, we got to go on a on a trip to some of the um, Mayan ruins, which are some of the the largest in the world, and 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 so you know the opportunity of a lifetime. And uh -huh. as I look back on it now, I'm like, wow, did I really appreciate that for all it was worth? Mm -hmm. um, and so this is all over and above this opportunity to build this huge bridge um, that went from one side to the other. Um, and this was your first trip overseas? It was my first trip overseas um, and my first deployment. Mm -hmm. um, 
But literally, we went in, we built the base camp from the ground up, because that's where we were going to stay. Mm -hmm. And then we built the bridge, mm -hmm. um, and then we tore down the base camp and, and we redeployed. A and all of that was done in about a four-month period. Mm -hmm. Back to Colorado? Back to Colorado. And then what happened? Um, then you get to practice, um, because you are an engineer, because I was an engineer, mm -hmm. um, and I was in a construction unit. There are different types of engineer units, but I was in a construction unit. Um, and those are perishable skills. And so I had the opportunity, um, although I'm not specifically an engineer by training, mm -hmm. um, by, by educational training, the Army has given me the rudiments. Um, but I was in charge of electricians. I was in charge of plumbers. I was in charge of carpenters. And so we practi the, practiced those skills on the installation. So on Fort Carson, we would do different building projects. Um, which was great. Mm -hmm. um, and during that time, I had the opportunity. Um, it's called being in garrison when you're when you're at the installation. It's it's just a term that the army uses. Um, but then had the opportunity to deploy to the National Training Center, which is in Fort Irwin, California. Mm -hmm. And it's where the army goes to play, not to play, but it's where the army goes to train. Mm -hmm. um, and it is this huge area where they can take all of their tanks and all of their pieces that they take to war um, and practice in the wide open spaces and they get to do maneuvers in these huge, basically in the de desert. Mm -hmm. It's a one of a kind place and so I, I had the opportunity to go there um, and be the bad guy. Ooh. And so as, as the U.S. forces are training, we're putting in obstacles to ham hamper their training. And so it was a great opportunity from the, ch from the perspective of, I got to see how the folks in the mm -hmm. tanks and the folks um, in the infantry fight and maneuver, but also how they overcame the obstacles that we put in. Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't under the same amount of pressure that the guys who were being evaluated right. were. Mm -hmm. So great opportunity to watch it without mm -hmm. getting the report card. Excellent. <laughs> and, and it was a great opportunity. And, and the National Training Center really is a, a neat place just because it is so huge. And, and I, I don't know off the top of my head how large it is as far as acreage. Um, but it's a huge part of mm -hmm. that area. So what year does this bring us to now? This brings us to right about 1993, 1994. All right. And, and are we still a second lieutenant? We have moved on to being a first lieutenant. Okay. Um, and actually then, shortly after coming back from the National Training Center, I morphed into a captain. Congratulations. Um, which was a, a great thing. And, and shortly after that, I deployed to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Um, the Army, Army has afforded me many opportunities to see mm -hmm. different parts of the world. Okay, so now you're at Guantanamo Bay. What happens now? It's, it, it was during the, um, we called it the, the, the boat people crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so it's when there were so many people fleeing Cuba and so many people fleeing Haiti, um, and they were all jumping on these rafts and mm -hmm. trying to float to Miami, and the Coast Guard was going and scooping them up out of the ocean. Mm -hmm. and, um, taking them to Guantanamo Bay to, to pro figure out what to do with them. Mm -hmm. um, and so much like the Army needs a place, a base camp to, to put soldiers, they needed an area in Guantanamo Bay to, to put all of these refugees. Um, and so I was there for six months building the, the base camps to house these refugees um, mm -hmm. until something could be decided as to where they were ultimately going to wind up. Did you ever have contact with any of these refugees? Just on the periphery. Mm -hmm. um, most of my contact was with um, the Marines who, who were there, the Navy who was there, so other service members. Um, I guess I, I got to interface with the, the refugees on a peripheral basis. Mm -hmm. um, they set up a, um, a really heart-wrenching art exhibit. Um, they had asked for crayons and paper because mm -hmm. they, they had nothing and so we gave them crayons and paper and some of the drawings that these folks captured, that the children captured, that the um, the adults captured of their experiences on those boats wow. were just heart-wrenching um, because many of these people 
saw their spouses drowned, saw their parents drowned, and they, they put that on paper. And so you would walk through this art museum, for lack of a better word, it was about as big as this room, not very, very big, um, floor to ceiling drawings like that. Um, you know, I, one was done all in green, green, mm -hmm. green crayon, crayon, color crayon. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a hand reaching out of the water, and you knew he was going down for the last time. And so just to think of whose family member did that, mm -hmm. and what memories do they have, and what, how desperate they must have been mm -hmm. to risk everything, to try to leave their country, to go to another country, and, and what drives people to that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, it, it was a great deployment from the, the perspective of the mission we did, mm -hmm. and giving them someplace safe to be um, until the State Department and, and the, the political level could mm -hmm. figure out their fate. Um, but other than, you know, that's, that's my overarching memory of it. Okay. And, okay, you're six months in Guantanamo Bay. What happens after that? After that, I come back to Fort Carson because mm -hmm. that was home at that point. Um, and there are certain career, wic um, in your career path as, a, as an officer, certain classes that you must take. Mm -hmm. And so I came back from Guantanamo Bay and it was time for me to go to the, the advanced course. Mm -hmm. So you do the basic course when you're a brand new second lieutenant and then you do the advanced course when you're a captain. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went to the advanced course and um, once, and you learn more about building stuff, you learn more about mm -hmm. leadership and how to be, how to function at the next level. Um, because each job you're in in the Army, they're always grooming you and challenging you and developing you to lead at the next higher level. Um, mm -hmm. To the Army's credit, they do a very good job of, it's great that you're here and doing these things, mm -hmm. but let's think about what's next and let's, let's think about le setting you up for success for the long term. Mm -hmm. And so the advanced course is one of the ways that and we do that. How long did the advanced course take? It, it was right about six months. Another six months. Mm -hmm. And then I got to go to, um, and so this is right about 95, 96 time mm -hmm. frame. Um, and technology was just starting to be, come into play. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were just starting to get computers. We were just mm -hmm. starting to, to deal with that. Um, and I got to go to a mapping course mm -hmm. after that which doesn't sound like much, um, except for we, you know, we were learning about satellite imagery and GPS mm -hmm. and all of these things that we now take for granted right. was cutting edge stuff then. And, and you're like, you mm -hmm. mean, this will tell me exactly where I am on, wow. uh, you, you know, down to the, right here. Um, mm -hmm. So I got to see that from its infancy. Um, and so all of the modeling that they're now doing with satellite imagery, mm -hmm. the Army was training us on 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, and, and again, totally blissfully unaware of what an amazing opportunity I was being afforded. But as I look back, I'm like, wow, how cool that the Army was thinking far enough ahead to mm -hmm. allow me this opportunity. And so now I have a better appreciation for how powerful a tool, you know, GIS is and mm -hmm. how powerful a tool GPS is and right. how it makes our lives easier as civilians, but also mm -hmm. in the Army and doing our, our Army mission. Okay. So you're a captain, you've learned your first generation G, uh, GPS and what have mm -hmm. you, what, what follows? What follows? It, I, my next duty station was Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, where in Germany? Where in Germany? Um, Bomberg, Germany, which is in um, Bavaria. Oh, nice area. Oh, yes. And so, uh, again, the Army has, has put me someplace that other people pay a lot of money to go. Mm -hmm. And the Army is telling me, here's where we're going to send you and we're going to continue to pay your salary while uh -huh. you're in. The Germans go there to vacation. Mm -hmm. It's that nice. Yes. Um, and I wasn't there long and then I deployed to Bosnia. Mm -hmm. um, and Bosnia was another wake-up call. Mm -hmm. Just from um, my starkest memory of, of that was um, you would drive down the road and you would see bombed, bombed out house, bombed out house, and then you would see a gorgeous house with flowers in the windows mm -hmm. um, and a beautifully manicured lawn, and then you'd see bombed out house and bombed out house. Um, and so the pinpoint accuracy with which 
the various sides were fighting each other, mm -hmm. and you could tell who was controlling the town by which houses were still standing. Um, and, and you would drive down the road and you would see the interior of the house and so you'd see a, a floor mm -hmm. and you'd see the second level and there's no front of the house but people are continuing to live there mm -hmm. uh, because that's all they have. Right, right. Um, so that was just another a wake-up call of mm -hmm. I always thought when I was there it would be really good if every high school student would have an opportunity to go overseas and see how the rest of the world lives because mm -hmm. um, I think we would better appreciate what we have here and how precious it is. Definitely. So what were you doing in Bosnia? We were, I was with a, um, I was with a combat engineer unit then mm -hmm. um, and I, I was the first woman that they had had in that unit. They had just opened up combat engineering to, mm -hmm. to females. Um, and so I was, I was the first one to, to get to them. And they were doing, um, I was in charge of maintenance of, of all of the, the mechanics. Um, so I didn't spend a lot of time on the road, but I, I spent enough time to get to see the area. Mm -hmm. um, but all of the heavy equipment that everybody was using as they were out on patrols doing their peacekeeping operations, mm -hmm. they would bring it back at night and then we would fix it up and, and push it back out the gate in the morning. Mm -hmm. and, um, you just mentioned that you were the first woman in, or one in of the In that first. particular unit, yes. At any, um, at any point, had you experienced any kind of discrimination because of your gender? Uh, no. I, I will, um, many people will tell you the Army is a, is a man's game mm -hmm. or something along those lines. And it is, by virtue of the fact it is predominantly male, mm -hmm. um, the, there are certain characteristics that go with that, but the Army I will say has done a tremendous job of being very, um, any opportunity my male counterparts have had, mm -hmm. I have had as well. And so I have always been evaluated on my performance, mm -hmm. not my gender. Good. Um, and, and the Army has been very, very good about fostering that climate of it doesn't matter mm -hmm. if you're male or female, it doesn't matter if you're pink or purple, black or white, you're a soldier and you're mm -hmm. here to do a mission. Um, and, and I've got to admire the, the Army leaders for being so forward-thinking mm -hmm. and instilling that from, from the time you hit the front door of the Army mm -hmm. through your career. That is ingrained in the culture. Mm -hmm. So how long were you uh, in Bosnia? I was there for, for about three months. Mm -hmm. um, I, I caught them on the tail end of their particular mission. Mm -hmm. um, and then I actually wound up going back to, to Fort Carson. It was a, a quirk of fate. Um, a quirk of fate. A quirk of fate. It, sometimes things happen, and, and you mm -hmm. go, you get ch your location changes. And mm -hmm. so I wound up back at Fort Carson, um, and I was there for doing more engineering stuff, mm -hmm. and, and back doing construction engineering stuff. Um, and this was about 1998. Okay. Um, and we did, you know, again, you're doing the construction there on the installation, but then we, we deployed to Egypt um, because the U.S. does, she's, she's laughing as I, um, I've had lots of opportunities to travel. Um, no kidding. But um, every two years, the, mm -hmm. the U.S. government and the Egyptian government do a joint training exercise mm -hmm. with the two, the U.S. military and the Egyptian military. Um, and so our job, as the engineers was to go in and build the base camps for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, all of the, the guys came in who were going to do the exercise. They did their exercise. They all left. Mm -hmm. um, and then we demolished the base camps, tore them down, um, put everything back, put the desert literally back to what it was before mm -hmm. we arrived, and then uh, rolled out of there. Um, leave nothing behind. Leave nothing behind, exactly. So what was Egypt like? Egypt was... Of the places I've been, mm -hmm. I, I probably enjoyed it the least. Uh -huh. um, I appreciated the wide open spaces of the desert. Um, the cities, I, I spent some time in Cairo, spent some time in Alexandria. Um, very, very crowded. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the whole, um, because it is so crowded and there's not a lot of good traffic control, mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for accidents. Mm -hmm. um, 
So any place that you've got pedestrians and donkeys pulling carts and bikes and mopeds and cars, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. um, and then you add speed to that, it, it just it makes it even more interesting. And so you would see cars sometimes hit people and just continue driving on. Mm -hmm. and, and it was accepted in their culture that that was okay. And that was a little disturbing to see. Mm -hmm. Um, on, on some level, um, and I didn't do well with the crowd. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a, a personal yeah. challenge that I have. But the desert was stunning. Mm -hmm. We did have the opportunity to see the the pyramids mm -hmm. uh, on our last day or two in country, um, and, and you know they're huge. They're mm -hmm. but it's. It's also interesting because what you don't see when you see all of these great pictures of the pyramids on National Geographic, et cetera, they're, they're always taking it from one angle. Mm -hmm. And if you do an about face and look behind you, the city of Cairo is literally right up on your doorstep. And so the city ends here and the pyramids are right there. Uh -huh. And then there's the wide open desert. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. So it made me value. <laughs> Ironically, it made me value our national parks and what a nice job we've done mm -hmm. keeping the open spaces and keeping the distance between urban sprawl and our national mm -hmm. treasures. Um, and I got the feeling that perhaps foreigners appreciated those pyramids more than the Egypt Egyptians mm -hmm. did because they're right there in their backyard. They kind of just took them for granted. Mm -hmm. um, just a perception. Mm -hmm. So you were in Egypt for? Egypt was about three and a half months. Three and a half months, and then what happened? <laughs> Back to Fort Carson. Um, and after every deployment, you go through, um, basically you reset and then you mm -hmm. get ready. So you, you come back and you dust off all your equipment and you bring it up to, mm -hmm. um, shipping equipment overseas is very, very hard on the equipment because it goes by ship. Mm -hmm. And so you're without it for the six weeks that it takes it on the boat to get there and you're without it for the six weeks that it's on the boat to come back. Mm. Um, and then you spend, you know, a good two or three months doing the maintenance on it, getting the parts in, mm -hmm. um, giving it an overhaul and a tune-up so that it's up and running and mm -hmm. function fully operational again. And so you go through this, you know, while you're deployed, you're operating at this level, and then you come back and you're, you're down here, and then your equipment mm -hmm. comes back, and you're operating full tilt again, trying to get it ready to go right. for the next mission. And what was the next mission for uh, you? Back to Bosnia. <laughs> back to Bosnia. Um, and it was interesting because about four years had passed since I was there the first time and, and going mm -hmm. back. Um, the changes that you saw, um, and it was a case of, in some cases, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Mm -hmm. But in other cases, you saw um, progress. Um, more so on the in the countryside, mm -hmm. which I was surprised at, versus the big city. Um, and so, and I happened to wind up in the exact same spot in Bosnia I had been in mm -hmm. 1996, and that's unusual. Um, and, and so I got to see houses that had previously been bombed out were now um, at least rebuilt and occupied, and, mm -hmm. and some commerce was coming back, and so you saw that progress. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I also had the opportunity to go to Sarajevo, and it was still, the, uh, the airport worked, but that was about it. And you would drive by these hotels that used to be five-star hotels, and they were still just mm -hmm. rubble. Um, but while we were there, we were building a lot of base camps mm -hmm. again. Um, because they were going through, um, when we first went into Bosnia, we put lots of itty bitty base camps in lots of different areas and, mm -hmm. and as more stability came to the region then we started to consolidate where we had U.S. forces mm -hmm. and where we were turning things back over to the community and so as we were consolidating we needed more facilities in central locations and so our job was to build those facilities in mm -hmm. central locations. Okay. And how long were you in Bosnia for the second time around? That one was seven months. Seven months. Mm -hmm. And this would bring us to around early 2001? Um, right at 1999-2000, yes. Okay. And after Bosnia? And then I went to, my next assignment was at Fort Lewis, Washington. Okay. Um, and I got to um, 
be a, a trainer. They, mm -hmm. uh, they call it a trainer or observer controller, but you go and you help reserve units do their training. Mm -hmm. um, because when you're in the reserves, you're drilling one weekend a month and then you've got your two weeks of annual training. Right. And that's not a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, and so to help them really hone in on, hey, you really need to think about training on this and getting the most the most out of those weekends that they were training, they assigned active duty personnel to, to assist with that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got to work with folks who were doing bridging. Mm -hmm. I got to work with folks who were doing construction. Mm -hmm. And I also got to train military firefighters, which was a mm -hmm. new experience. Mm -hmm. um, but again, um, and firefighters, when they train, they every little kid likes to play with matches and fire. It's just, you know. Oh, no. So <laughs> when, when firefighters train, they have these huge two, three, four-story solid concrete buildings, mm -hmm. and they build a huge fire in there, and they toss you in, and they shut the door behind you, and you fight the fire. And so I had the opportunity to, to do that. And you put on all of the, the bunker uh -huh. gear, and you put on their breathing apparatus. Uh -huh. um, it, a, it gives you a tremendous appreciation for what city firefighters do on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, but it also gives you an appreciation for how truly challenging firefighting is just in general. Mm. Um, because what you see in the movies is not what real fires look like or behave like. Because mm -hmm. um, it's, it's dark and when the smoke, they always talk about the smoke, it's pitch black and you can see nothing. And so mm -hmm. the images of firefighters r racing in with mm -hmm. the ax at hand, typically you're going in on your hands and knees, staying below the, the right. smoke line. Um, but again, the Army paid me mm -hmm. and, and gave me the opportunity to learn this, this skill on, mm -hmm. not, you know, I'm not a firefighter by, by right. any stretch mm -hmm. of the imagination, but to learn the basics of the skill mm -hmm. and a, an appreciation for it and actually get to participate in that and uh -huh. you know pull in the hose line when it's fully charged with water it's heavy stuff and mm -hmm. up and down those stairs with the hose and the bunker gear and the breathing apparatus after about three steps you're going <laughs> and thinking about these guys who that's just the start of their their job and mm -hmm. then they actually get to the fire and they're having to maneuver and pull people out and maneuver them at heights and at, you know, in crisis situations and how difficult and challenging it is to uh -huh. keep a clear head and make good decisions mm -hmm. while you've got somebody panicked here and somebody who is mm -hmm. injured here um, and you can't see anything and the noise and just amazing. Yes. Did you ever have a chance to use that kind of skill? Um, not, not directly. Not directly. No, thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just, from a, a life experience standpoint, it mm -hmm. was really humbling. Yeah. Um, and, and so then, as part of that, I got to. Um, sometimes the military during when we have wildfires mm -hmm. out west, the military if they run out of. If they need additional folks, sometimes the um, National Interagency Fire Center will tap military to, mm -hmm. to come in. And so one of my summers I spent in Boise, Idaho mm -hmm. with the National Interagency Fire Center acting as the liaison between the troops that they were bringing in to augment mm -hmm. the firefighting crews and um, their, their full-time firefighters. And that wow. was just... So again, I get to see the wildfires, I get to experience that, um, I get to see how another federal agency works mm -hmm. and functions, um, and how the Army can, can help support that and mm -hmm. augment that. Okay, so now we're in the early 2000s, and mm -hmm. are we still a captain? Or? We're still a captain, um, about to get promoted to major. All right. Still in Fort Lewis, Washington? Still in Fort Lewis. So um, what happens now? Then um, the next, then it's time to go get educated some more. Okay. Okay. Um, and so as part of the education, um, they have changed the name of it, but basically it's the Command and General Staff College, mm -hmm. and, and they select you, and they send you for a year to Fort Leavenworth, mm -hmm. Kansas. Um, and so you spend a year working with your peers, um, learning how to function as a staff officer at mm -hmm. higher levels. 
um, because up until this point in your career, it's all been very much hands-on um, right. and directly influencing. Um, and so now the Army is teaching you how to indirectly influence other mm -hmm. folks and, and lead folks. Um, so it was basically a year of graduate level work. Okay. Um, and then on to my next assignment was back to Germany. Where in Germany this um, time? This time Schweinfurt, which is just down the road from Bomberg. <laughs> Um, still so Bavaria? Still in Bavaria. Um, and for three years I got to, um, I was the, the DPW, the Director of Public Works. So mm -hmm. basically, uh, to put it in civilian terms, I was the facility manager mm -hmm. for the, the military installation there. Mm -hmm. And so I was in charge of the, the maintenance for all of the housing. I was in charge of all of the buildings as far as the care and maintenance of those, any construction going on. Mm -hmm. That was my responsibility. Um, so I had my mm -hmm. fingers in lots of little right. pies. So during this time, of course, 9-11 happens. Mm -hmm. well, uh, do you remember what you were doing or where you were when that happened? I was, I was actually in Fort Lewis when that had happened. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a little surreal because Washington is the state of Washington is three hours behind the East Coast, mm -hmm. and so I was just getting up, and I was <laughs> going to sound horrible. I was checking email, and I was you know texting somebody back and mm -hmm. forth, instant messaging somebody back and forth, and she said, "Hey, there's you know a plane just flew into the World Trade Center," and I didn't th you know I'm thinking little plane. I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe a fighter plane went off course or something or gee what a what a funky thing, mm -hmm. um, but yeah that was it was surreal mm -hmm. and so then you turn on the TV and you see mm -hmm. the whole thing unfolding, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the the in, all of the military installations are are locking down the gate and. I was living off post at the time, and so I, and you know, they're trying to do a nose count of who's where, and mm -hmm. you know, do we have anybody in that area? Do we need to be worried about anybody? Do we have any soldiers who have family in that area? Um, so that was quite interesting, mm -hmm. um, and so that was a huge topic of conversation, and huge teaching points as I went through the the general staff college the the following year. And then when I got to Schweinfurt, the way we built installations and buildings on installations changed dramatically mm -hmm. after 9-11 because you had to meet certain construction standards for um, car bombs or for, you know, your windows had to have a certain um, film on them so that if, if there was an explosion outside of it, um, it would um, disintegrate in a certain way. Right. Um, when you see buildings fall or you see buildings in an explosion, you always think about the rubble mm -hmm. and the concrete. And actually the deadliest thing is is the shards of glass flying. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so they gave us a lot of force protection construction training. Mm -hmm. And it, it, when you do this, when you treat a window this way, it mm -hmm. keeps it from doing, you know, it keeps it from turning into these huge projectiles. Mm -hmm. and, um, so that was very interesting. but also made building a challenge, because yeah. it, it adds to the cost, it adds to the time. And of course, um, you're still in college when, this, when Iraq and Afghanistan, mm -hmm. our current engagement. Right. Um, what's been going through your mind about all this? You, you know, you, you watch it happen and you know as the news reports are developing and as mm -hmm. they're starting to pinpoint where things where the plan originated and what they think happened and, mm -hmm. and Al-Qaeda, you know it's just a matter of time mm -hmm. and, until we're going to go in. It's not a matter of if, it's, mm -hmm. it's a matter of when. Mm -hmm. um, and so that became a huge focus at, at work um, on, on every level of, because the Army is going to, not the Army, but you know, the president is going to give certain guidance, and based on his guidance, then the military develops plans on how to execute that. Mm -hmm. And so, the president's here, and we're in a unit far, far removed, mm -hmm. but his decision is going to have an effect on, right. on us. And so, you're trying to anticipate okay, if he decides this, then we need to do this. And if he decides this, we need to do this. And so, you're doing a lot of 
we call it course of action development. Mm -hmm. So you've got plan A and you've got plan B and you've got plan C and you're trying to fine tune all of those so that you're, when he says go, mm -hmm and we're gonna go left, you've got the plan that says, okay, here's how we mm -hmm. support his desire to go left. Or if he says, we're gonna go, but we're gonna go right, you've got a plan that supports right. that. So what happens after you get out of uh, command center? Um, wound up at, at Schweinfurt doing mm -hmm. facility stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and after and, that? And after that, I spent three years doing that, and I was kind of disappointed because all of my peers were, you know, we're in the middle of Iraq, we're in the mm -hmm. middle of Afghanistan. They were all going and the uh -huh. job I was in was not a job that you deploy from. And so uh -huh. it was really hard watching them go and I'm stuck here. Uh -huh. I'm stuck at the installation doing the facility stuff. And that was the longest deployment you've had up to this point. Right. So, you know, I spent my three years in Schweinfurt, and then I went to, um, then I had my opportunity to deploy, and mm -hmm. I went to Afghanistan mm -hmm. with the Corps of Engineers. So this brings us to when? Would be June of 2006 that I deployed. All right. And what part of Afghanistan did you deploy? I, all over. All over. Mm -hmm. um, initially, when I first got there, I wound up in a little town called Herat. Mm -hmm. Um, which is on the western side of the country, mm -hmm. and it's probably 80 miles from the Iraq border. Mm -hmm. um, no, from the Iranian border, I'm sorry. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, it, so yeah, as far west as you can get without being in a, another country. Mm -hmm. um, and we were building, <laughs> gee, we were building base camps again, mm -hmm. uh, but this time on a far grander scale, and we were building them for the Afghan army mm -hmm. um, because at that time Afghanistan didn't have an army um, because the Taliban had this this chokehold on them mm -hmm. um, and so we were building bases the con the engineers were working on building the infrastructure and building the bases and then you know my, my peers who were there who were infantry officers and armor officers were working on recruiting and training the mm -hmm. Afghan army um, and so they had to have a place to stay and that's what our job was to provide it for them Okay. So how long were you deployed in Afghanistan? I was there for almost two years. And were you in direct uh, line of fire at any point? I was fortunate that no, I was not. Um, now I spent a lot of time on the road. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time traveling. Um, I, between, I held two different jobs while I was there, and between mm -hmm. both jobs I had an opportunity that most folks over there don't get it. I got to travel and see pretty much all of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and so just, it, it is a stunningly beautiful country, mm -hmm. the, the mountain ranges and the wide open spaces. Um, and it is so desperately, desperately poor that it hurts when you mm -hmm. see it. Um, but yeah, just fascinating place mm -hmm. overall. Did you have a chance to meet with any of the natives? Or? I, I met with a lot of the Afghans, and actually I had an opportunity to, um, I had Afghans on my staff. Mm -hmm. um, mostly the younger generation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, when I was there, I was, what, 39, 40 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had two, when I first got there, I had two young Afghans who worked for me, and they were 22, 23, so about mm -hmm. a generation behind me. Right. Um, and it was just interesting. Um, they were very interesting young men. Um, they, they were really leery about working with me. Mm -hmm. um, when they heard that they were going to have a, a woman boss, they were beside themselves because they just, they, it caused them no amount of stress and angst until I got there mm -hmm. um, because it is so foreign to their culture to have any interaction with any woman other mm -hmm. than their mother or their wife. Um, they weren't sure how to handle me. Um, and it took them a long time to warm up to me mm -hmm. and, and really have conversations with me. Um, and then hearing about what their life was like when the Taliban was there um, and what their families sacrificed to keep them out of the way of the Taliban. Um, both of them had fled to, both of their families had fled to Ira Iran mm -hmm. when the Taliban first showed up. 
um, and spent, you know, one left a very high position in the Afghan government to get his family to safety, and they mm -hmm. stayed gone until after 9-11. Um, and so it just makes you realize that the changes we're, we're trying to facilitate there right now are going to benefit the generation after next. Right. Um, because there's such turmoil and such, um, such turmoil. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a very, the con their concept of it's a very tribal government. And so you go from one little village to another village to another. Mm -hmm and their governments are all different. And so a centralized government, we think in terms of centralized governments, mm -hmm. and they think in terms of tribal governments, and mm -hmm. so there's a little bit of a disconnect there okay. in how we approach things. Let's uh, back for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, when you hear media reports about the areas that you've been to Bosnia, mm -hmm. to Afghanistan, um, are they accurate in any way, or oh. you just you just want to kick something at the TV. <laughs> I, I always, no, typically they're not accurate. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that's a little disheartening mm -hmm. at times. But I also have to remember, I'm not sitting in that reporter's shoes at mm -hmm. the time that they are making the report. And so what they are seeing may be very different from what I saw mm -hmm. weeks or years or, or months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so from that perspective, I, I have to keep in mind that's their reality right now. Um, and, and, you know, it's not appropriate for me to get into what their bi biases may or may mm -hmm. not be. Um, and it's the same, you know, with Afghanistan or with Bosnia. Mm -hmm. What they're seeing um, or who they're representing sometimes flavors what they're reporting. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so I, I try really hard nowadays when I hear reports of this is what's going on in Afghanistan. I have friends who are deployed right now, and so I'll call and say, what's the reality? And sometimes it meshes nicely, and sometimes it's about 180 degrees off. Okay. So it just it depends on the reporter. So end of deployment in Afghanistan takes you to what year, around 2008? 2008. Yeah. And then what happens? And then I came here. You came to? I came to Natick, Massachusetts. Which is about as far removed from Afghanistan as one could it, get. It was culture shock on many, many levels. So what, um, what did the Army deploy you to um, Natick Labs, or were you requested? Or? Um, I had an opportunity to, to command, mm -hmm. which is, um, the Army only has so many opportunities for officers to command, mm -hmm. and so it's a privilege to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very competitive process, and if you've got a pool this big of folks competing, typically only this many get selected. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're selected and you're offered that opportunity, it's a great, great mm -hmm. privilege. And at the beginning of this, what rank were you? Lieutenant Colonel. And so. how long had you been a lieutenant colonel? I'd been a lieutenant colonel for about a year. Okay. Um, so what um, what are your duties at the Soldier System Command? I am the the garrison commander, mm -hmm. um, which means I am I don't do I am not in charge of nor do I do any of the research that the labs are famous for, mm -hmm. but I provide the infrastructure so that they can do the research. Um, so I provide all of the logistics support. Mm -hmm. I provide all of the infrastructure report, support. Mm -hmm. Not me personally, but right. the folks mm -hmm. who work for me provide um, logistics and the infrastructure support mm -hmm. and um, the personnel support, um, the, the, the network support, that, that sort of stuff, so that the folks doing the research only have to focus on the research. Mm -hmm. Um, and it frees them up from having to worry about all of the other, the other stuff. All of, we call them ankle biters. Um, mm -hmm. We're re we're responsible for that, and in that way, the the PhDs can really focus on their their task at hand. Mm -hmm. So now you've been at Natick Labs for about almost three years. Almost three years. Almost three years. And uh, you, anything you like about Natick? Dislike? It's it's um, it's a fascinating place, mm -hmm. um, the labs themselves. It's 
it, it's just interesting because many of the things that I wore when I was deployed in Afghanistan, so many of the things I had on my uniform, mm -hmm. many of the things I had on my body armor were, was developed there. And so it's very interesting to see from whence it came. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting to see all of the different iterations that they go through to make sure that what they're pushing out to the soldiers in the field really does what we need it to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's fascinating to see, uh, they've now got it set up that somebody in Afghanistan can call and say, hey, I need a widget that does this or has this capability. Mm -hmm. And there's somebody at the lab who will fabricate it. Mm -hmm. And then they'll send it downrange to the folks in Afghanistan or Iraq and say, does this work? Does this do what you need it to do? Yeah, but could you tweak it a little bit like this? And so there's that very dynamic mm -hmm. give and take. And I was blissfully unaware of all of that. Uh -huh. I just knew somebody was pushing me stuff and, and sending me <laughs> stuff that I needed, and it was magic. Yeah. Well, now you've been in the Army for about 25 years. Just 20. Just, just 20. 20. Just 20. <laughs> but, I mean, what, what 20 years? That's been, I mean, what's unfolded between all the electronic gadgetry mm -hmm. and deployments and what have you. Is there um, anything you wanted to, to add? or? It's just, it's been a privilege to mm -hmm. serve. Um, and I remember being a brand new second lieutenant, looking at the lieutenant colonels and the majors going, mm -hmm. man, they're old. <laughs> and looking at them going, man, they've been in the Army a long time, and mm -hmm. just thinking to myself, I'm never going to get that old, and I'm never going to be in the <laughs> Army that long. And now I look back and I'm like, Where, where'd the time go? Um, mm -hmm. but, and now I am one of those old folks. Well, <laughs> last spring, uh, in May 2010, mm -hmm. Library uh, held a salute to women veterans, and you were one of the keynote speakers. What was it like for you being in a room full of women veterans, many of whom served in the Second World War? It was, it was humbling. Mm -hmm. um, and I really, the stories that those women shared on, on their videos that they did just made me think, um, boy, I've had it so easy compared to what they walked into mm -hmm. um, because they had no idea you know, by and large, what they were going to be doing. They had no idea how long they were going to be doing it. Um, there was not a lot of support for them, either from their families or from the military. Mm -hmm. um, they were just kind of this anomaly, and in some cases it felt like it, they were an afterthought. Um, and, and none of them really articulated that, but as mm -hmm. you listen to their stories and some of the challenges they had to have, you could s tell that not a lot of forethought had gone into, hey, we're going to bring these folks on with these mm -hmm. skills and we're going to fully employ them. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, you know, these lovely ladies who are in this room did so much to ensure that future generations would have an easier time serving, regardless of their, gener uh, of their gender. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, it, it, it truly was humbling. Um, and the nurses who described what it was like being in the hospitals and being being there with those young men as they were recovering and mm -hmm. they were so badly bad, badly wounded and all I could think about is how marvelous that we have the technology now for our soldiers who are wounded and how challenging for those young ladies then um, because we didn't know about PTSD and we didn't know about um, when you come back from an experience like that, that you need some time to decompress and, mm -hmm. and to process, and that it's okay to take that time to process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they immediately went from one reality, high stress, seeing horrible things, to another reality of now you're expected to be this. A and I often wondered if they felt like they had the rug pulled out from underneath them. Mm. Um, and they were so gracious. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were so, so humble. Mm -hmm. um, and they were so grateful for their experience and the opportunity that they had had to serve. Mm -hmm. um, they were just a blessing. They were fabulous. Mm -hmm. And before we break, 
Uh, you mentioned that you were married. Mm -hmm. Is your husband in the military? He's not. Yeah. He he has been very very supportive. He was in the military many many years ago before mm -hmm. I met him. Um, he served five years in the Air Force, um, but I we got married about halfway through my captain years, so mm -hmm. right about the ten year mark of my career, um, and has been tremendously supportive. And mm -hmm. every time the Army has said, "We're going to pick you up and move you here." Mm -hmm. He has not hesitated or flinched. He's just said, okay, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm here to support you. Mm -hmm. And so I've been very blessed. Do you see yourself uh, being in the Army for at least a few years longer? A couple more years, okay. and, then, and then it will be time to think about other things. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody reaches a point in their career where they say, I'm done, or they say, no, I'm going to keep going and, mm -hmm. and seeing what, what goes on, and I'm not quite there yet. Okay. Any other comments uh, for those who are going to be seeing this in the future? <laughs> um, it's just been a great experience. Mm -hmm. um, and the city of Natick is, I've got to believe it's, it's unique in the fact that they are doing this oral history and capturing something that is so perishable, mm -hmm. um, but capturing it on a medium that will um, be here for generations to come. Mm -hmm. Um, I just think that's very forward-thinking and very admirable. Well, thank you. And thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Carrie Otto, for thank your time you. and your participation in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. It is truly, truly a privilege for me to be here and have the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I can't tell you how humbled I am to be in the company of such marvelous, marvelous women. Um, ladies, my hat is off to you. The, 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 your accomplishments are just stunning. Um, what a magnificent nation that we live in one that dedicates a day to recognize the armed services, as well as the people who have served in the armed services and the people who support them. Um, that is truly something that makes this nation great, and I don't know that we always remember that. I have to, this, we're gonna get a little interactive here. How many veterans do we have in the room? Please raise your hand. Okay, if you have, keep them up. Keep them up. If you have done the DVD for the oral history, you may put your hand down. Okay, if you have not done the oral history, I would beg you please consider doing so. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. I don't know if you understand what a true gift those DVDs are. And I want to take a moment to compliment this community on their foresight. The Veterans Oral History Project is absolutely amazing. You've captured firsthand experience of so many who have served. The accounts of their service and their experience is absolutely captivating. Um, I popped the DVDs in throughout the week and I was watching them on some specific folks. It was amazing. It, it held my attention and their stories, the stories that you ladies told of your experiences if I had read it in a book, it just wouldn't have had the same impact. To see it and to watch your body language and to see the pride and to hear the challenges that you guys faced, absolutely amazing. Um, and I am humbled that I had the opportunity to see those DVDs. This is a marvelous gift that you've provided your community as well as your fellow veterans and as well as your families. So, so please think about that as you're hesitating. I'm not singling you out but I am. <laughs> so through this program, I got to share the memories of some great women who have served our nation in prior wars and prior conflicts. And the challenges that you ladies faced pale, make, make the challenges that I've faced in my career pale by comparison. The other thing that struck me was how vivid your memories are, even 60 some years after the fact. Um, some of you had notes that you referred to, but most of you were speaking from memory, um, and your memories were vivid. As I watched these interviews, I kept thinking to myself, these are truly, truly amazing women. 
and I don't know that everybody understands that, but some of the things that you over overcame and the challenges you faced and how successfully you did so, amazing, absolutely amazing. Your enthusiasm, the pride in your service, contagious. And if I had to sum up what I took away more than anything else, feisty, absolutely feisty. Um, and it came through loud and clear in every single interview. Um, and I watched eight or nine different interviews, but that, that resonated with me in, in every single interview, the, the same tenacity and the same feistiness and the same spirit. During World War II, women made up about 5% of our armed forces. In the 1950s, that dropped to, to almost two, to just about 2%. Since then, we have been steadily climbing and we're almost at 20% today. I'd like to share with you some of the commonalities of our service and highlight some of the differences. So as I was watching these videos, some of the things that, that the ladies were talking about really resonated and I said, yeah, I've experienced that as well. Um, each lady was asked, why did you serve? And the, the reasons they gave really told a lot about their spirit and their sense of commitment. I wanted to make a difference. It seemed like the right thing to do. There was a need. That one was most telling. There was a need. I could fill that need. I stepped up. This one I loved. They were standing over us, waiting for us to graduate. This was spoken by somebody who was at nursing school at the time. And during World War II, there was a tremendous need for nurses. Um, so they were standing over us, waiting for us to graduate. And it was simply understood that when we graduated, we would serve. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a negotiable. It was understood. This one I truly loved. My mom thought it would be a great idea. <laughs> And part of the reason that one struck a chord is the reason I'm in the Army today is my dad thought it would be a great idea. <laughs> there were times during the videos, and, and by and large the videos were wonderfully uplifting and, and just gave me this great sense of pride, and I shared their enthusiasm. Parts of the, video, of the videos were, were a little hard to watch, um, specifically when we started talking about and listening to you and every lady talked about it, how do we deal with our injured soldiers or those soldiers who had injuries? Um, and they talked about the amputees. They talked about the gunshot wounds. They talked about the burns. Um, those same injuries that they struggled with in World War II and the Korean War are the same injuries we struggle with now. Um, and the implications are the same. They talked about the nightmares that the soldiers had and holding their hands at the hospitals at night and telling, just being a calming presence. Um, and that was a, a theme that resonated, whether they were a nurse or not. That was a, a way that they served. Um, one lady talked about, and she was terribly insightful, a physically wounded soldier is easier to heal than an emotionally wounded soldier. Those experiences were for, from World War II, but we are experiencing that same thing today as we have soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, those were the commonalities that I saw as I was watching these DVDs and these videos. Now we'll talk about some of the differences. And probably the biggest difference that we'll talk about is what I call the time-space continuum. Um, traveling into theater during World War II, they talked about it took days, it took weeks. Um, it took us 28 days to get from point A to point B. Well, now we get a little frustrated when we're deploying when it takes us 28 hours. And so patience must have been a virtue during, during those times. How long was your enlistment? Until the war ended. They were, that was their contract. I was going to be in the military until the war ended. Nowadays, we have definite and finite times that our enlistments last. Where were you going to serve? Every single lady said, I didn't know. I knew I was going to go someplace. I knew I was going to do a job but I didn't know where that was gonna be. To the point that they were getting on boats, where, were you, where was the boat going? I didn't know. I knew that when the boat landed, we would get off and we would do our job, but I didn't know where it was. That was amazing to me. Um, and yet they still had this sense of adventure, this sense of duty, this sense of service, and, and they went and they did their job. 
nowadays we're, we're a little spoiled because we know exactly where we're going and we know exactly how long we're going to be there and we know when we'll come back. That wasn't a known. The job I trained for is not the job I did. This came out a couple of times and this is, we, we experience this now in, in the modern army. We just call it cross training. So they, they train us for one job, they put us in another job, and they say, this is cross-training, we're helping broaden your horizons. Okay. Um, they talked a little bit about communications with home. How did you talk to the folks at home? You didn't. You, you could write letters, and the letters took days, weeks, months, years to get back and forth. The marvels of technology now we have phones that can go back and forth instantaneously, and we've got email. It, it's a marvelous thing. So for us to think about deploying and not being able to talk to loved ones or not being able to communicate or only being able to communicate through letters is a, is a real reach for us. Um, so my hat is off to, hat is off to you ladies because that's just amazing. I was so impressed with the tenacity and the fearlessness of these ladies. I am also thankful for their service and the lessons that they learned and the changes that came about in the military because of the, their service. All of the, the great things that you ladies did have provided me an opportunity to have a career and to cause the services to change and to realize what great talent women bring to the table and bring to the fight. Um, I don't have to look far to see the next group of women who will be headed towards leadership positions. When you meet our soldiers in our, at the U.S. Army Institute of Environmental Medicine and the Natick Soldier Research and Development Center, you see the best and the brightest in our Army today. We are going to continue to have the best trained and best equipped Army in the world, and some of these women in uniform at Natick will be leading the way. I want to thank you for inviting me to speak today. Please take a moment to pray for our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen and Merchant Marines who are protecting our freedom as we speak. And please say a prayer for the families of those who are separated from their loved ones serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. Thank you and God bless our great nation.